Welcome to Green Mountain Mornings here on WINQ AM Brattleboro. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I have in the studio with me, Wendy Levy from the Commons. Hey there, Wendy. Hey, Olga. I like your, your blue glasses today. Thank you. They're they quite They match your hair. They do. <laughs> See, this, this goes back to our beauty tips with, with Wendy and Olga. Yes. Um, coordinating accessories with hair color. Yes. How to look fabulous um, while also being really lazy. <laughs> <laughs> we could write a whole book on it. You know, totally. it would, we should write that book because it would be a bestseller. People need it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do something cool with your hair. Get cool glasses. Leave the house. You're done. You're done. Good shoes. <laughs> yeah. Good shoes. Good shoes. Well, except I'm wearing Birkin, Birkenstocks today, but I don't think those are going to show up no. on camera. Well, I mean, my, I have bare feet on right now. Oh, yeah. My shoes <laughs> nice. got wet this morning. Oh. <laughs> but speaking of kind of like fashion accessories and going out in town and being seen... <laughs> We've been talking a lot with, like, I, I spoke with Chris Mays from The Reformer, okay. as well as Peter Elwell, the town manager for Brattleboro. Yeah. And they talked about parking and some of the changes that they want to make. But you brought up some really interesting points about parking. Yeah. So just to kind of recap for folks at home, if they haven't, you know, heard um, your conversations with Chris and Peter or they haven't read the articles, there's a proposal for um, – for downtown Brattleboro to get a complete overhaul of the parking system. So all the meters and all the little machines, you know, at the lots are going to get switched out. Right. And um, the new machines will allow um, people to pay for parking with credit and debit cards, which if you remember uh, earlier this year when the town contracted with um, with Desmond to do a parking survey, mm. they also did they did a study, and part of that was a survey amongst um, people in town. Actually, you didn't even have to live in town. You could be a visitor here or commute to work. Anybody could take the survey. Right. So what, you know, as they say on TV, survey says <laughs> people, want, um, people want credit and debit cards. They don't want to be able to use that as a form of payment. What ended up being kind of low on the interest level was smartphone apps. Hmm. But that ended up getting a lot of traction because um, uh, because other people in town really wanted it. Notably, Stephanie Bonin of the DBA, you know, appeared at a select board meeting to really push for it. Hmm. So what um, town manager staff, when they did their research, they found um, that they could have an integrated system and upgrade the machines to take everything to do smartphone app, credit and debit cards and cash. Hmm. Well, this is going to be expensive. Yes. It's 200, Something, over 200,000 dollars. Yeah, I think 270 either 260, 260 to 275,000 dollars. So there's the cost of getting the machines and installing them, but then there's the operational costs which are going to be different mm-hmm. and higher because with taking credit and debit cards and smartphone apps it's going through a credit card company mm. and, and, you get fees. and you get fees. You get something that is you. I love corporate euphemisms. It's a convenience fee. Uh huh. Whose convenience is it? Right. Anyway. So to, so they estimated the town manager staff estimated that the um, convenience fees and costs for operating this new system would be about $50,000 a year. Mm. Yeah. Which is, you know, some money. Yeah. <laughs> so um, they are able, they're thinking that they're able to borrow rather than going out to like a lending institution, they're going to borrow from another fund, but not for the operating costs. So they're going to need to raise parking fees. The proposal, and it's not passed yet, like right. it would require a change in the ordinances, which takes time. The proposal is to change parking on Main Street to a dollar an hour. That's up 25 cents an hour. And then in all the other lots and street, raise it by five cents an hour, which isn't, it's not, the parking rates haven't gone up since 2009. Yeah. It happens. But 
the point that was made at the select board meeting and Brandy Starr, select board member, asked this question, I'm, sh- I'm glad she did, when they're talking about raising the rates to cover the operational costs for these convenience fees, she said, well, would that be, f- you know, would those rates go up also for people who are using quarters mm. or, you know, whatever coins? And assistant town manager Patrick Moreland said, yes, he confirmed that. So... So pan the camera back a little bit mm-hmm. on this one. People who use money, currency, mm-hmm. to pay for their parking are subsidizing parking for people who are who have access to a smartphone mm-hmm. or who have a credit or debit card. Interesting. Yeah, I it is interesting. <laughs> That's the best way I can come up with it is is interesting. Um town manager staff does not want to add extra cost like when you when you pay for a dollar's worth of parking they want you to get a dollar's worth of parking they don't want it to be like a dollar plus that fee right they want it to you know what you pay to be equal to what you're getting um but you know at the expense of people who are using coins Mm -hmm. so that's something that yeah people should pay attention people should pay attention to thank you wendy wendy and i are going to head off to break but She's given us a lot to think about. (laughs) We'll return momentarily. Welcome back to Green Mountain Mornings. I'm your host, Olga Peters. You're listening on 100.3 FM, AM 1490. And my guest for this segment is Wendy Levy. Hey, Wendy. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Olga. Thank you for having me on the radio program. You are so welcome. Tell me, did you manage to get into any of the primary parties. I did. I did. I managed to get into the Wyndham Four. Hey. Um, I know, which is great because it's, you know, it's nice to go to a contested <laughs> election party. We don't have many of those. No, which is really sad. But, you know, I was pretty excited that during this primary season, there were a number of contested races, mm-hmm. you know, for, for governor. Yep. And for Wyndham One and for Wyndham Four. Yeah. Which is where I was hanging out. So Wyndham Four is Westminster, Putney, and Dummerston. Mm-hmm. And this year, the contenders for um, representative to the legislature on the Democratic ticket were um, Mike Merwicky, mm-hmm. the incumbent, and uh, Nader Hashim, who is new, and Cindy Jerome, who is new. Both of those folks are new to politics. So I got myself into Nader's party, which was happening at the uh, Putney Diner. And this is the first time I've ever covered a primary. So this was kind of exciting. Like, oh, you know, what, what's this going to, actually, it's the first time covering an election in this way. Usually I just go to a bunch of town meetings. And when I say a bunch, I go to like four town meetings. Yeah, you do go to a bunch. (laughs) I really do. So it's like, oh, well, I've never been to an election party before. Okay, I'll go and like talk to people and talk to the candidate Mm -hmm. and wait for the results. So the party started at six. It included a dinner that um, the owner of the Putney Diner, Eleni, had made for everybody. It was a buffet thing. It was very nice. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And I mean, it's a Putney Diner. It's it's a great place to hang out, I think. It really is. Yeah. And so, you know, I got to talk to people. Some friends were there, some old friends. Um, I got to talk to Nader a little bit. And um, the results started coming in. It was fun being at the party where the person won, you know, won because mm-hmm. Merwicky and Hashim came in in first and second place, respectively, um, in the primaries. And so there's no, as far as I know, no serious Republican contender. As far as I know, not unless there's going to be some kind of write in. Yeah. Yeah. Which, oh, excuse me, which, you know, good luck with that. I mean, write ins aren't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, there were, I think, three races in Wyndham County that without any major party mm. opposition. So that would be Wyndham one, mm-hmm. the yep. Senate and then Wyndham four. Um, What's the one um, oh, for Sarah Coffey? What district is that? There is a write in candidate and he this could be interesting because Sarah Coffey in the primary received about 111 votes. OK. And Patrick Gilligan, who's running on the GOP ticket as a write-in, received 50-something votes. Hmm. So they will be oh, they, going okay. against each other. In the general in elections. Yeah, in the general. Okay. 
but yeah, so it was fun to be at the party for the, you know, for someone who, um, you know, won, you know, came out ahead in the primary. It was really exciting. Yeah. You know, it was really sweet. And then after, you know, um, shortly after the results were announced, Mike Merwicki, who was at the Putney Fire Station, which is where the elections were, he came to Nodder's party. So that was a great photo op. Yeah. And I got to chat with him for a few minutes. But um, yeah, it was nice to see people excited. Mm -hmm. You know, it was nice to see people, um, you know, feeling some appreciation for the hard work that they did on on behalf of, of you know, of their candidate. And yeah. to see a person spending time and talking with um, his future constituents and, mm -hmm. and you know, some kids got to stay up later than they normally do. <laughs> so they Probably little, had more sugar than oh, they normally yeah. do. Well, yeah, because Eleni put out all these really good brownies. Oh. <laughs> But yeah, it 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 was one of those things um, that I think is kind of sweet about being a small town reporter. Wendy, thank you. I I agree. It is one of the best things about being a small town reporter. And uh, municipal coverage, while it's not always sexy, it can really be fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's about people and and personalities mm -hmm. and you know and sort of yeah and the stories that emerge from those things. Wendy and I will return after the break. Now it's time. This is Green Mountain Mornings on 100.3 FM, AM 1490. I am Olga Peters, your host, and my guest is Wendy Levy from the Commons. Hey it's there, Wendy. It's true. Hey, Olga. Good it morning, everybody. It is true. See, we don't just sit around and make things up. We actually talk <laughs> about true news. things. Fake news. Fake news. <laughs> ah. Oh, boy. <laughs> so yeah. tell me, Guilford is looking into internet access. Isn't everybody, mm -hmm. but yes, this is the story that I'm following. So it's funny because it goes back a couple months, um, many, many months ago, Paige Martin, who um, until recently was the children's librarian at Brooks Memorial Library. Right, right. She came to Brattleboro to, to sorry, to Brattleboro Select Board meeting to talk about um, municipal broadband. Mm -hmm. And this isn't, a, you know, a strange topic to the area. Vernon was working on setting up a, a, a sort of a smaller regional municipal broadband that right. would involve Vernon, Marlboro, Guilford, and Halifax. Oh, okay. Yeah. As that would be could, hitting some hot spots. I'll say. Yeah, or or cold spots at, you know, at least in terms Very of internet connection. <laughs> we don't have any. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that fell through, unfortunately. But, you know, these areas are still as they say, woefully underserved mm -hmm. by internet. I mean, if you ask a person from, you know, from almost anywhere in Vermont, other than maybe like Montpelier or a lot of Chittenden County, how's your internet access? Mm -hmm. You might get a raised fist. You might get a blank stare. <laughs> um, you know, we we don't have a lot of access and we don't have access to high speed internet right. either. I think in Wyndham County, the percentage of households that have access to one gigabyte or more is something like 7.9 percent. Wow. And statewide, it's 14 percent. I got this. I did some research Ouch. and I'll get to the Guilford conversation in, in a, you know, momentarily. But anyway, um, yeah, we're ranked something like 38th out of 50 states for connectivity. But none of you. I'm were, surprised we're as high as 30. I know exactly. And I'm like, okay, all the people <laughs> who I'm saying this to are like, yeah, Wendy, tell me something I don't know. Yeah. So in Guilford at their select board meeting recently, um, they had a conversation about this. So Sheila Morse, who is the select board chair, and Gordon Little, who's one of the select board members, have been working on some research for bringing fiber optic internet to the entire town. Mm. And this goes back to a couple years ago when the Vermont Council for Rural Development came for their visit to Guilford. And one of the, the things that townspeople wanted to talk about was, um, was economic development and uh, supporting the grand list. And it's hard to attract younger people or anybody really, anybody who wants to start a business to a town if there's no good internet access. Right. So Sheila brought some figures that were really alarming about what it'll cost um, on one road in Guilford, Melendy Hill. Um, I think that's how you pronounce it, Melendy. Yeah. Um, which is right off of, runs right off Route 5. Okay. To run about a mile of fiber optic up that road would cost something like $80,000. Ouch. And each household would have to pay 
like at least a thousand dollars to get the fiber optic line run from the road to their house. Wow. Who can afford that? Especially if, that's if you're a renter. I mean, even if you're a homeowner. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, that's painful. Right. And so, you know, pretty much everybody has electricity. Pretty much everybody has phone, um, you know, landline, because that's regulated. And there's funding for that. Mm -hmm. But internet, especially high-speed internet, is subjected to the free market. Good old free market. I know. It is so helpful, especially in this situation. And so what company is going to invest that much money mm -hmm. to bring high speed internet to a place where they're not going to be able to um, have a as many customers as say in downtown Burlington, right. where the population is more dense. So and, uh, a company that Sheila and Gordon found themselves talking to was Velco, mm -hmm. the Vermont electric, I don't remember what it stands for. They're the people who run the grid. Right. In the state of Vermont. So you're probably thinking to yourself, why the electric would, grid, the electrical grid. Yeah. Why would an electric company, what does that have to do with being an internet service provider? Mm -hmm. Well, they've already run lines throughout the state. Aha. Uh -huh. Into almost every town. There are substations where they um, have to communicate with each other, with the main office about what's going on in the grid mm -hmm. is all fiber optic. Huh. And they have something like 55 substations in the state. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I think I see where you're going here. So the thing is, so when I heard about that, I was like, well, that's really weird. I've never heard that before. Mm -hmm. And Sheila sent me links to a bunch of websites. This is not unprecedented. Mm -hmm. This is happening across the country, mostly in rural areas, not right. entirely. Um, sometimes it's happening in more populated areas where... People want municipal broadband. They don't want to be subjected to, you know, maybe one or two providers that aren't providing great service. They want to have some control, some agency. Mm -hmm. So who's stepping in? Mostly, especially in the rural areas, it's rural electrical cooperatives, which we have one in this state up in the northern part. Yes, we do. And in fact, it's former CEO, now gubernatorial candidate. Christine. Yes. Yeah. She kind of prefer. Uh, proposed something similar. Yeah, um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I talked to her. Actually, met her this past Sunday, mm -hmm. which was really neat. And we talked about that a little bit because I had just um, filed the story. Oh, neat. Yeah, about um, you know this conversation and and this attempt, and and she's like, oh yeah, this is you know, this is a thing that I'm pushing for too. So this is happening across the country. It's happening. It happened in Wales, also. I think in Canada where um, they're looking to the rural electrical cooperatives. And so this is um, kind of an echo of what was happening in the 30s and 40s when the rural electrical cooperatives were established. Right. Because For a similar reason as to why we're looking at internet now. Exactly. So electric companies didn't see any value, you know, any investment value in supplying sparsely populated areas um, with electrical service. You know, why spend all the money to run the lines if we can't recoup this? Because it was mm -hmm. seen as a profit model rather than a public service. Right. So the electrical cooperatives formed and all of a sudden, you know, you could plug in, you could get a toaster. <laughs> <laughs> you could get a hair dryer. You could have, you know, lights that turned on. And so here they go again, you know, doing the same thing. So with Guilford, it's not exactly a project yet because, as Sheila said at the select board meeting, this is too big of a project for the select board to manage on their own. Okay. So she's looking for somebody to come in who um, will be able to basically write a grant to, you know, to pay themselves and to take over this project. Wow. So if somebody out there wants to do mm. this... <laughs> And wants to bring, um, you know, fiber optic internet to Guilford. The, she said from the figures that she's collected, it's probably going to be about a $3 million project oh, for wow. Guilford. So, you know, it, it's it's pretty involved. It is really huge, but it could happen. And Guilford could be a model for other, other towns around Vermont. Wow. Yeah. That's very cool. <laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty exciting. So I'll be following that. I've also had some conversations with um, Representative Laura Sibilia, mm -hmm. who represents, um, what is it, Dover, Wilmington, up in that district. Yes, I, she's the, I think they call her the Wyndham Bennington. 
Yeah, district. I think you're right. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And then uh, Laura is also one of the directors at the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation. And in terms of economic development, the BDCC definitely has an interest in that. And and Laura has been fighting on multiple fronts and yelling and screaming about it, mm-hmm. you know, with good cause about, you know, contracts, you know, companies that got a bunch of money to set up mm-hmm. um, broadband and such and, and, you know, sell service and then didn't. Right. And, you know, what she told me and what went into my article is that she's telling communities, like, if you basically if you want Internet, high speed Internet, you have to do it yourself. Yeah. You can't wait for somebody to come and do it for you. Wendy, thank you You're for that welcome. great report. We will return after the break. Welcome back to Green Mountain Mornings on 100.3 FM, AM, 1490. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I want to welcome back to the show my friend and fellow journalist, Wendy Levy. Hey there, Wendy. Hey, Olga. Good morning, everybody. I have a question for you, Wendy. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. So as you probably know, I... I and John Walters did a piece at the beginning of the week mm-hmm. about some behavior at the state house uh, Val- between Representative Valerie Stewart and concerns that Becca Senator Becca Ballant had mm-hmm. brought to me. I did hear that. Yeah. You did hear about that. <laughs> well, I listened to the to the segment too. Why? Thank you. Well, you're welcome. I wanted to know what was up. What was going on? Yeah. Well. One question I asked lawmakers that I didn't get a lot of satisfaction on mm. was. When you have a lawmaker who is basically reached a point where they're not serving their constituents, Mm -hmm. which I kind of think is number one job of a lawmaker. (laughs) Yeah. The the term public servant means you're supposed to serve the public. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, A little thing there. Yeah. What what is the legislature's responsibility? And, mm. and kind of like, why didn't lawmakers bring this to the public sooner right. than the day before the the primary, essentially? Yeah, which to me is really irresponsible. And you and John talked about this for, for anybody who, who didn't listen. You know, it doesn't allow the voters to process that information or to follow up with it, mm-hmm. to talk to Valerie if they, you know, if they can, you know, if they're able to talk to her, mm-hmm. to talk to, to talk to anybody. And, right. and I will tell you, I live in Wyndham one. Right, I, so this directly, I, impacted this directly you infects a, me. Yeah, yeah. I would have, I would have liked to have known, mm-hmm. but anyway, so you were saying, well, it got, it got me thinking. And when I ask this question, I'm, I'm not getting much satisfaction. I'm kind of mm. getting crickets. Mm. But it made me think of a town you cover a lot, which is Putney, mm-hmm. which for a time had a non-existent, for lack of a better term, <laughs> town clerk. You know, right. they had elected someone. Yep. And then for a number of reasons, she didn't come to work. Yes. And, Putney, and didn't resign. And didn't resign. So Putney was kind of stuck for a while. Right. What What did you find? I mean, what did Putney finally decide was the role of serving I mean, because she was elected official, so... Yeah, and for a while they weren't talking about it publicly. And, you know, there's so much... There's so much about this situation, the Putney Town Clerk, which has since been resolved. Mm -hmm. Um, And and the Valerie Stort situation, there's a lot of similarities there, but it it brings up a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of them is... Yeah, the responsibility to the public, but also maybe protecting a person's privacy or, you know, in the case of um, of Denise uh, German, the um, or German, I think that's how you pronounce her name, German, who was the former Putney Town clerk. When you don't when you don't know what's going on because mm-hmm. they, they didn't know why why she had left. She right. wasn't communicating directly. The yeah, I think it brings up a lot of. Issues of like not wanting to talk poorly about somebody, mm-hmm. especially if you don't really know what's what's happening. Um, but yeah, there's that tricky thing of like, well, people need to know, especially if they're their constituents, if they're not serving their interests or not serving at all. Mm-hmm. And really, the main issue I see here is that in Vermont, we don't have a recall mechanism for an elected official. So in this in the case of um, the Putney Town clerk, it was only a few months after she had been elected to a three-year term that she just stopped showing up. Mm-hmm. And until she resigned or moved or died, 
or there was another election, there was no way to bring in a new town clerk. Hmm. And similarly with the legislature, you know, my question is if people had strong enough concerns, and these are her colleagues, about Valerie Stewart's um, performance, you know, whether she's showing up for votes or showing up for committee meetings um, or how she's behaving toward her colleagues, um, you know, if folks, if her colleagues had legitimate enough concerns, what could they have done? Mm -hmm. You know, is there a censure process? Because um, if there is, I mean, there's no, there's no recall mechanism. You just have to wait until the next election. And depending on how long somebody's term is, Mm -hmm. that could leave a portion of the public and essentially, I mean, really the entire state, especially if somebody's in a committee and Mm -hmm. a a vote is needed or if or if you need a certain number of votes to, um, you know, to alter an outcome. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, you you, kind of have to show up. (laughs) Um, You know, it could be argued that the entire state isn't being served beyond the person's constituency Mm -hmm. if somebody is not doing their job. But but then what can be done? Yeah, I felt at times covering this this particular situation with the legislature and, and, and Valerie is they were trying very hard to be nice yeah. and very hard to be ca- compassionate, which is noble. Sure. But they had almost been compassionate to the point of inaction. Yeah, and that's my and concern. leaving voters in the dark. Yeah, absolutely, because I only found out about this on Monday mm-hmm. from, from hearing the segment on your show um, and I had already voted. I did early mm, voting. Right. And I'm not going to say who I voted for. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I and the other folks who live in Wyndham one deserve to know about that because there, there was our opportunity. Mm-hmm. Like when we talk about no recall mechanism, there is, there is the one of yeah. not, of not electing that person again. Mm-hmm. But if we don't have that information, we can't even make an informed decision using the structure that's been set up for us to decide who should be in office and who isn't. Right. And, you know, I mean, Emily Kornheiser, who, um, you know, was running against Valerie, did win. So Mm -hmm. now we know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's not good enough because should this happen again? And it probably will. And it probably will will because human nature. Yeah. And you never know what's going to happen to a person. A person could show up. And, you know, their behavior could be consistently um, professional and respectful toward their colleagues and they could show up for all their votes and do all their committees. And then something happens in their life, something Mm -hmm. traumatic and everything changes. Right. And they don't want to. I mean, I'm thinking best like of my best intentions toward a person. They don't want to step down. You know, it's the thing that they're holding on to. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't want to admit that whatever this traumatic thing happened is getting them down, um, when do their colleagues step in and say, hey, you've done great work, you need to take a break? Mm -hmm. There needs to be some sort of structure for that. And when when do the colleagues tell the voters? Right, exactly. What's happening. Wendy, thanks for coming in today. Thank you for having me.